Okay. Hello and good, good afternoon. Good morning to our friends in California. Welcome to the second meeting of this PCOB's investor advisory group. Like the first, this is an open meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Chair Williams, our honorable board members, participating PCOB staff, members of this advisory committee, and the public for joining us today. We're going to start with some introductory remarks before diving into today's presentation. Please note that we have time built into today's agenda for Q&A that will begin after our first presentation from Barb Vanage. We kindly ask that you hold all your questions until then. Please remember to mute yourself if you're not speaking. With that, I will hand it over to board member Kara Stein to say a few words. Kara, please take it away. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Saba. Uh, my most important function today is to pass the Investor Advisory Group baton on to you, Saba. Um, I was happy to fill in on a temporary basis as the Investor Advisory Group co-chair because it was so important to us to stand up the Investor Advisory Group quickly um, and as the PCOB conducted its search for our first investor advocate. Um, your appointment as our investor advocate means that your full-time job is uh, investors, and I formally pass the co-chairmanship of the investor advisory group on to you. Um, of course, you're not starting today. You and Amy have been working hand in hand for several months in order to organize this meeting and to uh, help start to shape an agenda for the upcoming year. Um, I'm very pleased with today's agenda and it's uh, truly devoted to current and future issues that will affect the strength of public company audits. Um, this is a special time because it's the 20th uh, year anniversary of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And in my mind, the language in SOX reflects the understanding that protecting audits from business pressure and commercial change requires vigilance and critical observation by both auditors and regulators. So how do we do this? The statute was quite clear by tying everything back to the protection of investors and the public interest. Um, auditing America's, com America's companies is a privilege. This means strong rules grounded in the public interest work to protect investors, employees, and the capital markets. But these rules uh, need to recognize the realities and I would say the difficulties of auditing in a global economy. They can't just be a technical manual. I think any provision falls short if we cannot demonstrate how it protects investors and the public interest. The same test applies to all of the other PCOB programs, inspections, enforcement, international agreements, even staffing. And I think this is a particularly pr uh, critical time to think about what investor protection means. When a company begins a period of distress, management can take a denial approach. And this is when we often see earnings manipulation and fraud as short-term solutions to shortfalls in liquidity or operating resources. Investors and the public at hand are often the last to know when the economic consequences are reflected finally in the financial statements. Uh, when investors are harmed, the harm ripples out from the company, affecting employees, suppliers, and ultimately the entire financial system. And serious deficiencies in financial statements are often the after effect of turbulence in the underlying economy. I'm saying all of this today because current conditions of increased market volatility, I would say substantially increased and increasing interest rates, persistent supply chain and energy disruptions, and changes in our social and environmental conditions are all putting increase, sort of all increasing the threats, I think, of inaccurate or false reporting. Um, these strains increase the incentives to engage in misconduct, often viewed as temporary workarounds until a company regains its footing. 
uh, the rapid and unending digital transformation, which protected our economy during the pandemic in many ways, continues to add layers of complexity and risk. So I believe the work of the advisory group is vital to the health of our capital markets and our national economy. And that is why you can make such a difference to the board um, by looking at the outlines and details of what we propose and explaining how those proposals would affect investors' decisions and the flow of honest information to the markets. Of course, in a group of 18 high-level uh, professionals, there are bound to be differences of view. I think that's good. Let's celebrate those differences of views. And while our views may be different, all of us share, I would say, a collective mindset to advance audit quality, to protect investors, and further the public interest. So that's why today and the many meetings uh, we have uh, coming up are so important, uh, sharing your advice and your views. Your contribution becomes even more powerful as you work to accommodate and express those viewpoints to both us and the investing public. So for just a few months, I had the honor and privilege of uh, protecting, um, you know, uh, or helping start, I guess, ultimately the investor advisory group. So I now would like to turn over the podium to Saba and Amy and I look forward to this afternoon's meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kara. Amy and I really, really appreciate all your guidance, all your help and support. And we look forward to working closely with you as we work to implement the, as is this board's ambitious uh, agenda. Before I get into the details of today's program, I'd like to make the standard disclaimer that the views that I express here are my own and are not necessarily the views of any board member or a, any other member of the PCOB staff. I've had the privilege of working with you all for the last three months, and I've gotten to know many of you. But since this is our first public meeting together, I wanted to thank you all for your passionate ad advocacy on behalf of investors. So thank you. Everyone at the PCOB appreciates your counsel and recognizes the need to ensure that investor protection guides everything that we do here. That makes, it, that makes the work of this advisory group even more important. We have a packed agenda for today that was developed based on mutual interest after consultation with this advisory group as well as our board. Today's meeting will be a great opportunity to provide you all with an update on current PCOB activities and the important work that is already being done to advance our mission to protect investors. First, we'll have an opportunity to hear from Chair Williams regarding recent developments at the PCOB, including the recently signed cooperative arrangement with China. After Chair Williams, Barb will provide an update on the standard setting agenda that was released this morning and discuss our work on firm engagement and performance metrics. In addition to the PCOB presentations for the first time today, this board will have an opportunity to hear from members of the IAG on topics that are of interest to this group. Thank you in advance to all our presenters, Jennifer, David, and Gina. Thank you. Finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to my fellow co-chair, Amy McGarity. Through this process, I have, we have become really good friends, and she is a true partner. So thank you from the core of my heart for, for doing all that you do. I know you have a full-time job but just managing this process with me and working to protect investors, I, I know it takes a lot, so thank you. With that, I'll hand it over to Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Saba, and a sincere thank you for your guidance and support as co-chair. I'm honored to be serving in this capacity as co-chair of this important IAG. Our partnership has been a highlight as we navigate how to most effectively liaise with the IAG and the board for the benefit of the investor community. I am very excited for today's meeting to continue the collaborative feedback and education, which is critical to today's dynamic investment environment. I am also really excited about getting our subcommittees started on the important topics, which in addition to the ones we are exploring today, are of importance to the members of the IAG and the investor community. We will be discussing that a little later in the meeting. 
I'm sure that you all have heard about recent developments at the PCAOB. So it is with pleasure that I introduce Chair Williams, who will give us an update. So without further ado, Chair Williams, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amy, and thank you to Saba. And it's a real pleasure to see all of you. Reimagining our approach to engagement with investors is a critical priority for this board. And we're really thrilled to have you on our team as the PCAOB um, Investor Advisory Group. And we're really thrilled to have Saba as our first ever investor advocate. Before I begin, I want to issue the standard disclaimer that the views I express here are my own and not necessarily those of the other board members of the PCAOB staff. From workers saving for retirement to parents saving to put their kids through college to anyone who depends on the integrity of our capital markets to fulfill their future, people are at the heart of everything we do here at the PCAOB. And it's critical that we elevate the voices of everyday retail investors that we serve. As you know, reconstituting the investor advisory group was the first major action that we took as a board. And I really want to thank board member Stein for your efforts in coordinating and leading the IAG's first meeting and setting the foundation as we move forward. I also want to thank Amy for your service as co-chair, and I want to thank all of the IAJ members for your time and your insights. I look forward to hearing from them today. As you know, we do have a packed agenda, and I know that the board is really looking forward to hearing the presentations. Um, one of them is on data technology, which continues to evolve and is taking on a greater role both for preparers of financial statements as well as their auditors. However, it's not just preparers and auditors who are affected by these advancements. Of course, we need to consider these advancements from a standard setting perspective as well as when we inspect firms. But we also need to consider potential opportunities to change how we have traditionally presented our information on our website and what enhancements we can do to make this information more accessible to our stakeholders. And we're really looking forward to learning from Gina's presentation. We are very lucky to have the expertise of Jennifer Joe on the IAG and we're excited to hear her presentation on diversity. As you know, we are the most diverse board in the PCAOB's history and the diverse ideas and perspective that each board member brings makes us stronger. We have made increasing diversity a key focus of our strategic plan and we're thinking about it on multiple fronts. First, how can we increase diversity internally with initiatives like our affinity groups? And second, how can we use our platform to increase diversity across the auditing profession through our scholarships and other programs? We're also very grateful to David Pitt Watson for bringing his expertise to the IAG, and we look forward to hearing from him today. And we are looking forward to learning from all of you throughout the discussions. Together as a board, we have set ambitious goals for the PCOB from modernizing our standards, enhancing our inspections, and strengthening our enforcement, and improving our organizational effectiveness through initiatives like reimagining our approach to stakeholder engagement. We have a lot of work ahead of us, and the IAG will serve a critical role in advising us along the way. And just over nine months into our term, we're off to a very strong start. Earlier this year, the board announced one of the most ambitious standard setting agendas in the PCAOB's history. Today, we posted an update to that agenda. We are working actively to update more than 25 standards within eight standard setting projects, and we're just getting started. The PCAOB staff have put pen to paper on every single project, and they are diligently working to move them forward as quickly as possible. Barb is gonna provide us with a detailed update on our progress in the moment, in a moment, but we have already finalized the other auditor standard, and we expect to move forward with the quality control standard before the end of this year. I want to thank the IAG for your input on the importance of performance metrics at both the firm and engagement level. We are taking action. As Barb will talk about in a moment, we took the first step of putting this project on our research agenda. But make no mistake, this project, by placing it on our research agenda, it is a signal that the board is actively working to move it forward, and we're serious about getting it done. As you know, this board was very clear from the beginning that projects would not stay on our research agenda for more than a year. 
My plan is to move this project to the standard setting agenda in 2023 and advance it in short order from there. We will continue to rely on your consultation and input along the way. Inspections are one of the most important tools we hold. We have to hold firms accountable and keep investors protected. And our 2021 inspection reports for the big six accounting firms will be coming out later this year. And we'll, we will have a spotlight highlighting major trends and findings in the coming weeks. So we encourage everyone to keep an eye out for that. Our inspection team is constantly adjusting to be responsive to new and emerging risks across the globe, whether it's SPACs and DSPAC transactions, cryptocurrencies, or how firms are addressing the effects of supply chain disruption and rising costs on company operations. Our team likes to say the sun never sets on PCAOB inspections because each year the PCAOB inspects approximately 250 audit firms and reviews 900 audits from across the globe. But as you know, for more than a decade, our access in mainland China and Hong Kong has been restricted. In August, we took a first step toward opening up our access in mainland China and Hong Kong. I joined the China Securities Regulatory Commission and the Ministry of Finance of the People's Republic of China in signing the most detailed and prescriptive agreement we have ever reached. On paper, the agreement guarantees the PCAOB complete access to inspect and investigate any firm we choose with no loopholes and no exceptions. Now we must find out whether what we have on paper holds up in practice. Last month, PCAOB teams began arriving in Hong Kong where they are conducting inspections of firms headquartered in mainland China and Hong Kong and putting that agreement to the test. And by the end of this year, the PCAOB will make determinations whether the PRC authorities have allowed us to inspect and investigate completely or if they've continued to obstruct our efforts. If I sound like a broken record by saying no loopholes, no exceptions, good, because the law demands complete access, the agreement we signed with our Chinese counterparts guarantees complete access, and the PCAOB will accept nothing less than complete access when we make our determinations. The board is also approaching enforcement with a renewed vigilance. We intend to use every tool in our enforcement toolbox and impose significant sanctions where appropriate to ensure there are consequences for putting investors at risk and that bad actors are removed. This includes substantial monetary penalties and significant or permanent individual bars and firm registration revocations. We are rethinking how we identify cases, the types of cases we pursue and the sanctions we impose. Those who break the rules should know we won't be constrained by the types of cases the PCOB has pursued in the past. We won't be limited to the level of penalties that have been seen before, and we will seek admissions of wrongdoing in appropriate cases, for example, where the conduct is intentional or egregious. Under this board, we've more than doubled our average penalties against individuals compared to the last five years. And that includes the largest monetary penalty ever imposed on an individual in a settled case. At the same time, we've increased our average penalties against firms by more than 65%. In the past five years, the PCAOB has assessed penalties against individuals less than half of the time and firms only about 86% of the time. This year, it's 100%. Last month, we announced a settled disciplinary order permanently revoking a firm's registration and barring the firm's owner, as well as imposing a significant penalty for interfering with the board's inspection process. It was the first settled action in PCOB history with both a permanent revocation or bar and a significant penalty. And it demonstrates our commitment to remove bad actors from the profession and to deter misconduct. And as you know, we've been conducting more sweeps to get additional information from a number of firms at the same time on areas where we suspect violations may be occurring. And just last week, we announced results from one of those sweeps, which resulted in sanctions against four firms that failed to disclose who worked on their audits by not filing their form APs. None of this is possible 
Without the expertise, dedication, and hard work of our incredible PCAOB staff, I want to thank Barb and all of the PCAOB staff who are here to share their expertise with us today. And with that, I will turn the program back over to Saba and Amy to get us started. Thank, thank you, Chair Williams. Uh, next on the agenda is Barb, who will provide some details of the updates to the standard setting agenda that is posted on our website today. So please go take a look at it after this after this meeting today. Uh, I will not steal Barb's thunder, but just wanted to, to to amplify that the latest update reflects the great work that has been done since this advisory group met, la met last June, but it also demonstrates our commitment to transparency. So without further ado, Barb, please take it away. Thank you, Saba, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I begin, I too need to provide the disclaimer that the views I express today are my own and not necessarily those of the board, its members, or, or other PCOB staff. Um, if, if someone could advance the slide, please. So earlier today, uh, we updated the standard setting and research agendas, and, and you will see a number of changes. Uh, could you advance the slide, please? So let's start with one of our accomplishments since the last meeting. First, we completed other auditors. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, other auditors was removed from the agenda as it was approved by the board in June and the SEC in August. The amendments and new standards related to other auditors are effective for audits uh, beginning on or after December 15th, 2023, or said more simply, 2024 audits. With the ultimate goal of protecting investors, the amendments were designed to strengthen the auditing standards that apply when the auditor that issues the opinion, who we refer to as the lead auditor, uses other auditors in an audit. As stated in our previous public releases, working with other auditors can differ from working with people in the same firm. The lead auditor may encounter differences in business practices, market conditions, and cultural norms between auditors in different parts of the world. In addition, audit firms involved in the audit may have different systems of quality control, and their knowledge of US GAAP, PCOB, or SEC requirements may too differ. Therefore, the amendments are focused on increasing the lead auditor's involvement in and evaluation of the work of other auditors. We hope that the heightened attention to other auditors' work should improve communication among auditors and enhance the ability of the lead auditor to prevent or detect deficiencies in the work of other auditors. Just to highlight a few important aspects of the amendments, particularly in the areas of audit supervision and audit planning, the rulemaking seeks to take a risk-based supervisory approach. The amendments require that the lead auditor supervise other auditors under the board standard on audit supervision and inform other auditors about the scope of their work, identified risks of material misstatement, and certain other key matters. The amendments also require that the lead auditor and other auditors communicate about the audit procedures to be performed and any changes needed to those procedures. In the area of audit planning, the amendments require the engagement partner to determine whether the lead auditor's participation in the audit is sufficient for the firm to carry out the responsibilities of a lead auditor and report as such. The amendments in this area also provide considerations for the engagement partner to use in making this determination and also require that the audit's engagement quality reviewer review that determination. The amendments require that the lead auditor understand the aud other auditor's knowledge of independence and ethics requirements and their experience in applying them. And lastly, the amendments require that the lead auditor understand the knowledge, scale, and ability of other auditors' engagement team members who assist the lead auditor with planning and supervision. 
I won't get into any more details, but, but again, happy to answer questions uh, out after the rest of my prepared remarks. Could, could you please advance the slide? Next one, please. So let's talk about today's changes. So you will see seven changes to the agenda we shared with you earlier this year. Again, first we completed other auditors. Next, we updated the expected timelines for non-compliance with laws and regulations, attestation standards, and confirmations. We also added to the short-term agenda a project called AS1000 and a new standard setting project that considers amendments related to certain aspects of designing and performing audit procedures involving technology-assisted data analysis. And as a result of that, we have removed our research project on audit evidence. And finally, as Erica already mentioned, we have added firm and engagement performance metrics to our research agenda. So as we said earlier in the year, the agenda is meant to be dynamic. The short-term agenda now includes seven projects. And by way of reminder, a short-term project is, is a project where the Office of the Chief Auditor anticipates board action during the coming 12 months. The projects on the short-term agenda that we discussed at the last meeting include quality control, non-compliance with laws and regulations, or no CLAR for short, the attestation standards, going concern, and confirmations. And again, we've added two more, a project termed AS1000 and amendments related to technology-assisted data analysis. Now, over the summer, we've spent a lot of time with the board on the short-term projects, and since we last met with you, have made substantial progress. While each project is a priority, we know that one of the most important ways to keep investors protected is through firms' quality control systems that should be designed and operated to ensure compliance with PCOB standards. As noted on the agenda, we hope to present to the board a recommendation to propose a new standard on quality control this year. Like other interim standards, our quality control standards were, were developed before the PCOB was established. Since then, the audit environment has changed significantly, including evolving a greater use of technology and increasing involvement in the audit by resources from outside the firm, including other firms and providers of support services. Firms too have changed, as have the role of firm networks. Historically, our advisory groups have indicated general support for strengthening the QC standards, including support for requiring firms to apply a risk-based approach to designing, implementing, and operating their QC systems, and for enhancing requirements for firm governance and leadership. As advances in internal control, quality management, and enterprise risk management suggested factors such as active involvement of leadership focused on risk, clearly defined objectives, objective-oriented processes, monitoring and remediation of identified issues can all contribute to a more effective QC system. Taking these considerations into account, we are thinking about whether the QC standards could be improved by expressly requiring a risk-based approach to quality control, including well-defined quality objectives and a systematic effort to identify and proactively manage risks to achieving those objectives. Emphasizing firm governance, the tone at the top and individual accountability. Providing more direction regarding monitoring activities and remediation of identified deficiencies to encourage an ongoing feedback loop that drives continuous improvement and one that is intended to help firms prevent or detect QC problems before they result in engagement deficiencies. Addressing changes in the audit practice environment, including the increased participation of other firms and other outside resources, the role of firm networks, the evolving use of technology and other resources, 
and the increasing importance of internal and external firm communications. Providing for a rigorous annual evaluation of a firm's QC system and for reporting on that evaluation and updating requirements related to identified engagement deficiencies. So as mentioned, we continue to progress our projects on confirmations, going concern, and non-compliance with laws and regs. Since you last met, we've made significant progress on confirmations. While earlier we thought that we wouldn't have a board action until 2023, we now expect that there could be board action this year. With respect to confirmations, as you may recall from our last meeting, we issued a proposal on confirmations back in 2010. And like any reproposal, we started with the proposed standard and considered significant comments. By way of review, the 2010 proposal, among other things, required confirmation procedures for specific accounts, including cash and accounts receivable, incorporated procedures in response to the risk of material misstatement, addressed areas of investigating exceptions reflected on confirmation responses and for evaluating non-responses to confirmation requests. The proposal addressed certain aspects of technology used in the confirmation process. And so we're considering those comments received, but in addition, we're also taking into consideration the current environment along with the current use of technology and facilitating the confirmations process. While the use of technology to facilitate sending and receiving confirmations has changed over the years, what has not changed is that if properly designed and executed by the auditor, the confirmation process may provide important audit evidence. With respect to going concern and non-compliance with laws and regulations, we still anticipate action in the next 12 months. However, I note that we don't believe we'll be in a position to make those recommendations to the board this year. For our project on non-compliance with laws and regulations, we're considering among other things, enhancing the auditor's identification of potential non-compliance with laws and regulations and enhancing the requirements related to the evaluation and communication of potential instances of non-compliance. For our project ongoing concern, we're considering among other things, enhancing the auditor's identification of conditions and events that could indicate financial distress, strengthening the auditor's evaluation of the company's plans when determining whether those plans alleviate substantial doubt, and also considering the auditor's reporting of going concern uncertainty. With respect to the attestation standards, in September, we published a brief staff request for information and comment on matters related to the application and use of the board's interim attestation standards. Input from the public will help inform any potential staff recommendation we make to the board regarding updates to those standards. The request includes questions about the use of attestation reports, questions on current practice, potential updates to the requirements, along with questions to inform the economic analysis. Uh, the request for information is brief and, and the comment period extends until later this month. So as mentioned at the last meeting, we're evaluating the remaining interim standards and as we complete our work, we hope to add projects to the standard setting agenda. As part of our work on the interim standards, we added a project referred to as AS1000. AS1000 represents the first standard setting project related specifically to the work of our interim standards team. The auditing standards included in this group of interim standards are AS1000, which is the responsibilities and functions of the independent auditor, AS1005, independence, AS1010, training and proficiency of the independent auditor, and AS1015, do professional care in the performance of work. These standards are foundational and are applicable to all firms and to all audits. As part of our efforts, we're also looking at AS2815, which is the meaning of present fairly in conformity with generally accepted accounting principles, because it too <clears throat> could be viewed as foundational. 
These standards continue to be in effect substantially in the form adopted by the board in 2003. And in the staff's view, the concepts in these standards, for example, due care and professional skepticism, are very important and remain very relevant. However, we believe the standards could be modernized and streamlined through updates that would clarify auditor responsibilities and enhance the usability of the standards by making them easier to read, understand, and apply. In addition, the requirements in the standards could be aligned where appropriate with PCOB rules and board issued standards. You will note on the agenda that we anticipate board action on this project in 2023. We also added a project related to certain aspects of designing and performing audit procedures that involve technology assisted data analysis to the short term agenda. And these amendments are based on the past few years of research conducted by the staff. As the use of data analysis and the audit has increased, it's informed our thinking about certain areas of the standards where additional guardrails would be appropriate to ensure that certain risks related to the use of data analytics are consistently addressed across firms and that when used as an audit response result in sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Over the years, we've also identified areas where some believe the standards should be clarified to address data analytics as it's used in the audit today. In some cases, we've made clarifications through our staff spotlights on the data and technology research project. However, in other cases, we believe it may be appropriate to make minor amendments to our standards to make those clarifications. Now, in connection with adding this project, we removed our research project on audit evidence. That project was added to address matters identified as part of our work on data and technology. Those matters will be addressed through this project in addition to the staff guidance issued in 2021 on the use of information from external parties as audit evidence. As we don't believe there are matters that need to be resolved at this time, we removed the research project on audit evidence. If in the future, as technology evolves or other matters come to our attention, it's possible that addition, additional pro projects related to that standard could be contemplated. With respect to our research project on data and technology, we see the amendments on technology assisted data analysis as a first step to addressing the use of technology in the audit. As such, the research project remains on our agenda. Uh, we'll continue to understand information from our oversight activities and take the use of technology into account on our other standard setting projects. Finally, in response to views the advisory groups expressed back in June, we added a research project on firm and engagement performance metrics. The research project, as described on our website, includes considering metrics already disclosed by firms, along with the work that PCOB has done over the years and efforts by the investor advisory group. And we look forward to that discussion with you on, on that topic this afternoon. As audit evidence demonstrates, um, research projects help inform our standard setting agenda and are often the first step toward adding a new project to that agenda. Uh, meanwhile, moving to the midterm projects, not a lot to say here. We have assigned project teams. We're actively working on all of these topics and we continue to make pro progress. I'm happy to pause there and uh, answer questions that, that you all might have. Thank you, Barb. So the floor is now open for questions. If anyone has questions for Barb, please, this is your opportunity. Barb, I have a question. Um, at the beginning, you began. Could you please the... sta state your name? Absolutely. This is Gina Sanchez, um, and and um, question regarding the um, use of other auditors is that disclosed on the form AP? It, it is, okay. and so that that I, form would demonstrate that. what what other firms are involved in an audit. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Anyone else? 
it's just submitted about, by, uh, like Lynn by Turner Ryan in the chat. I was wondering if the PCOB has published anything around the review of technology assisted data analysis, either the preliminary outline of what was going to be looked at or results. Sandy Rich. Oh, sure. Sorry. So thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And so, sorry, I didn't see the, the question in the chat. Um, over the years, we've published several staff spotlights, um, which, which highlight kind of the results on a yearly basis, at least for the work of the Office of the Chief Auditor. Is that available through the website? It is, and and happy 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 after the meeting to send out links or or provide those. That would be great. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Sandy. So I saw Lynn had his hands up, hand up. Lynn, you're next. Thanks, Saba. Barb, uh, what does it mean? When you say that uh, firm and engagement performance metrics, formerly known as AQIs, um, is in the research agenda, uh, Jim Doty, as chairman, has previously discussed publicly that the Office of Research spent two years studying that issue. It's been on the table for the last 14 years. And yet you don't publish any schedule with respect to the AQIs. It almost looks like it's a slap in the face of investors. What are your plans timing wise on that? And was there a particular reason that the name was changed? Yeah, yeah, sure. Happy happy to respond to that. So so first, I mean, I think I think you heard from Erica about her intention of, of moving that and, and not having things sit on the research agenda. I don't think we were ready to provide any kind of timeline today, but I would anticipate that you would see that with the next update. In putting it on the research agenda, I think it means a, a few things. So on our website, we describe a re, the research agenda um, for projects where we're determining whether to have a regulatory response that could include guidance, standard setting, or something else. It also includes determining what the re regulatory response could be. When it comes to fir firm metrics, which, which I think may be a little broader than audit quality indicators, I could anticipate several potential regulatory responses. Uh, for example, if I look through the the former IAG recommendations, I assume that we will hear later, a number of which remain relevant, uh, there could be a response that feels more like a, an addition to quality control. So if you're talking about controls over information that's already disclosed by the firms or providing context necessary for users. I also saw recommendations about communications to audit committees. That too could be a standard setting response, uh, but I believe that in, in, the, in the, the materials, there were also recommendations about potentially educating audit committees on the value of certain metrics. And so that could be a different regulatory response. I think another potential regulatory response could be uh, information that's provided from our division of registration and, and inspections. So I, I know that's a little long-winded, um, but but just to say, I think that there could be kind of multiple work streams, and and we'll be working through uh, with your input what those might be. Yeah, I just I just find it disappointing that after 14 years since the recommendations came out that you're saying at this point in time, you still haven't figured out what you're going to do. So you put it on the research agenda and don't have a schedule. I know from the KPMG trial, we know the PCLB does gather a bunch of this data because they use it in their risk selection for the uh, inspections, which would be very helpful. But it would not be nice to see this data get to the, in the hands of investors since they're the ones that are having to vote on whether or not to uh, uh, keep the auditors or not. 
Hey, Lynn, okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks for sharing your perspective. We'll have a, a presentation on this topic, so I, I'm hoping to save all, all these, you know, your comments and questions for that session that will begin at 2.15. So but if if anyone has any questions on, on, on the, the center setting update that we published today, the presentation that George, uh, that Barb gave, please, please ask. But we will have plenty of time for discussion on legacy AQI and the firm, firm engagement session. So, Len, please, any further questions, please ask during, during that time. So, I saw David's uh, hand up. Yeah, David. thanks. Th thanks, Emma. Um, a couple of questions, Barbara. I'd just be interested, as you're thinking about your standard setting objective, to what degree and how and who are investors involved in this? Um, a, 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 how, how, is, how is that gone about, if at all? And then a second question is, as you're setting that agenda, to what degree is that agenda a seeking to dovetail with what standard setters outside the United States are doing so that you have consistency of global uh, reporting and that, that the world outside the United States can benefit from the sort of stuff that you're doing and vice versa? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so, so let me take the first question. I mean, I think we're always interested in investor views, whether, you know, voiced from outside of this group or inside of this group. Um, as we said at the last meeting, we wanted to get started. And so we picked projects that we knew from comment letters uh, sent in by former investor advisor group members that non-compliance with laws and regs was important, as was going concern. Um, with respect to, to your second question, I, I wouldn't say that we necessarily added those projects, right, as a result of what other people are working on. Um, from a standard setting perspective, the international uh, audit standard setters have updated those standards at least once uh, before their work today. Now we follow what they're doing and we'll be interested in um, seeing how they progress. But you know, we do think about information that's previously been provided us as recommendations from the IG or from our former standards and advisory group. Uh, we also look specifically at information that we learn from our oversight activities. And so we consider what they're doing, but we do take into account kind of the unique environment uh, that, that we live in and, and regulate. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I mean, the, the, there may be something, Barbara, just taking the first one on investors, I wonder whether there may be something that would be quite constructive in almost thinking about the, the market research that one would do amongst investors who are the users of accounts to think about, you know, where is it that that standards might a uh, be inadequate and um, a, a can be improved. And I'm, I'm sure as an investor advisory group, we would be more than happy to help with that either on our own or or, or bringing together investors that we think are interested in this topic. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, we'll take it back and discuss with the board. I can tell you that because non-compliance with laws and regs was formally on our research agenda, we did quite a bit of outreach, including with the former IAG members and, and a broader spectrum. Um, but certainly we'll, we'll take it under consideration. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, David. Does anyone else have uh, any questions? I don't see any hands. So, I mean, since we're running running ahead of our schedule, which is always great, if no one has questions, maybe we can move to our next presentation, which is also being presented by Barb. Barb? Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> someone wants to put up the relevant slide deck. Yeah, Barb, uh, we'll have it up in just a moment.
How did, do you have a question? I see your hand up. Yeah. If I'm on, okay, I'm not on mute. Good. Uh, we are going to have a chance to, to have more detailed discussions, if I understood Saba correctly. Is that on all yes. these topics? Okay, so I'm going to hold all of my questions until we have a more detailed discussion. No, the detailed discussion will be on, on this specific topic after this. But if you have right. questions okay. that are related right. to just the center setting update or like going, you know, going concerned other topics, then you can, you can, this is your opportunity. No, at this point, I'm, I'm holding off. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I can't see the anyone else. Any, any, are there any other hands before before we get started? Okay, so in response to comments uh, that we heard both at your last meeting and at at the first meeting of our standards and emerging issues advisory group back in June. Uh, we thought it would be good to have a discussion on firm and engagement metrics, all, also referred to as, as audit quality indicators. Um, for, for some of you, this is not a new topic, uh, but we do recognize that, that the board here is new, that we have new members on, on this group, and, and really see this as the start of a conversation. Uh, so for investor advisor group members who may have less familiarity with the topic, and with former efforts by the PCOB and IAG, we, we thought this afternoon that we would just provide a brief overview, um, maybe as a, a conversation starter. I don't intend to walk you through the, the slides in any kind of detail, but really just highlight some key points. And then to the extent you want to provide views today, we're certainly interested in hearing from you. Um, before we begin, I, I do just want to say that we understand to the extent the board hasn't taken action. Now, some of the earlier views provided by the IG may be very consistent with what we hear from you today, and, and that's okay. Uh, but some things have changed, and, and we're also definitely interested in hearing new perspectives as some time has passed uh, since, since the advisory group discussed this. Uh, if you could advance to slide four. So by way of background, the idea of audit quality indicators goes back to the 2008 report by the US Department of Treasury's Advisory Committee on the Auditing Profession or ACAP as you'll hear us refer to it. Among others, the report included a recommendation for the PCOB to determine the feasibility of developing key indicators of audit quality and effectiveness and requiring audit firms to publicly disclose those indicators of if to disclose those indicators of audit quality, quality are feasible and then require the PCOB to monitor these indicators. Over the years, both the PCOB and our advisory groups have discussed this topic on a number of occasions. Could you please advance to slide seven? So our investment investor advisor group has devoted substantial time to this issue, uh, and we're very lucky to have one of the original contributors, both to the ACAP report uh, and to the efforts of, of the IAG, and, and that's Lynn. Want to provide just a little commentary on the work efforts, and then and then Lynn, I'll, I'll pause to see if you have um, some perspective that you'd like to add to that. Uh, but, but back in October of 2013, the IAG made recommendations for firms to provide the PCOB with data compiled at both the engagement level and at the firm level. And many of those recommendations are likely still viewed as important today. There was a desire for public disclosure of audit quality indicators, um, and, and investors were looking for metrics that helped to measure the quality of the actual audit, to help establish accountability for audit quality uh, that were forward looking and also have information or predictive content. Now, in addition, it was noted that the PCOB's AQI initiatives at that time related more to audit firm quality and to the audit process than to audit quality. And in addition, there was a recommendation that firms should be required to provide the PCOB with data and selected audit quality indicators compiled at both the engagement level 
and the firm level and that this data should be subject to review, verification, and comment by the PCOB. Uh, the policy on the measurement and management of audit quality indicators should be made public. And then uh, this is a very summarized version of a, a very impressive work effort. But in 2017, the IAG again weighed in on AQIs. That, that presentation, which is also available on our website, also added focus that other audit regulators were addressing this issue, and there was some information on, on further global efforts. Um, before I move on to developments, maybe since this was last discussed with the IG, um, Lynn, would you like to provide any perspective on, on that work effort? Lynn, you're on mute. Let me that. Uh, I think Barb summarized it. Uh, the ACAP took it up because uh, there was some view amongst the people from uh, the business world that if public companies had to be transparent, then the audit firms who were a key component of the capital market system needed to be equally transparent and weren't, in fact, ACAP had requested a bunch of information from the firms, which they declined to provide some of it. So, and then the ACAP uh, got some written input as well as public testimony on this issue and thought it was important. It became part of the uh, our recommendations at the at the time the firms were focusing more on the european approach and doing firm-wide reports but and and had done that but those reports really don't provide any data with respect to whether or not a particular audit was high quality or not so by the time we got to the 2017 iag meeting the focus had moved off of the firm-wide uh, reports, which people didn't find very uh, compelling, and got to focusing on what made what was important to a particular investor, and that is our portfolio manager and analyst. What is the quality of the audit of the company they're actually investing in, um, and uh, so the focus turned uh, to individual audit. Uh, Greg Jonas, who had focused on the firm wide, left the PCLB, and um, I think that changed the focus somewhat to the individual audit perspective. But then, as with many of the projects, nothing ever happened. So this is something that's been discussed, debated, quite frankly, beat to death. And um, we did find out in the KPMG trial that the PCLB is actually gathering some extremely useful and helpful information. It would be to investors, and which is probably why the firm at hand tried to get a hold of that information so they could make their audits look better. So I think that was a telling story and a piece of the puzzle. So here we are today, and I think the real question today then is, I've sat through these presentations year after year now for 18 years, and things have come and gone, but progress on them has been exceedingly slow and painful. So that's why I asked the question about what does it mean to be on the research agenda? Because it's been sitting on the research agen agenda now, we know, for about 12 year, or 10 years. If I could jump in, um, and I appreciate the background very much, Lynn. It's very useful, especially for this board, which is relatively new to, to hear directly from you about your experience in the past. Um, and I just want to make clear that the research agenda that this board has put forward is, is different. There are projects on there, they're not gonna stay on our research agenda for more than a year. And by placing this project 
key performance metrics on our research agenda, it is a signal that this board is actively working to move it and that we are very serious about getting it done. And my plan is to move it to the standard setting agenda in 2023 and advance it from there. So I do understand the history. We, we do wanna learn that history here, especially from this ad investor advisory group and make sure that we get it right. Thank you, Chair Williams. Then do you have anything to add or should? Oh, I, I just say, uh, if Erica can pull that off, kudos to uh, Erica, because it's, it's a lot of things that are being dealt with like this need to be taken care of before uh, we get into, um, get to, towards the end of the 2024 election cycle, because that always seems to uh, cause things to be viewed and dealt with in a different light. So what you're talking about is having to move it off the agenda into standard setting and then completed by 2024, we could be dis having the same discussion with a whole new group after that, hopefully not, but given recent history, it would tell us that that would be the case. Okay. Then, go ahead, Saba, were you gonna say no, anything? I said, I I thank, gonna no, no, I said thank you for sharing your perspective, Lynn. We can just move on to Barb to continue this, her presentation. Yeah, no, th thank you very much for that. Um, just, just for the benefit of, of newer members, um, we did issue a concept release, as, as Lynn mentioned, that was the, the, uh, the work of a former director of, of ours, um, and it sought comment on, on 28 potential indicators and, and got, I think, a, a pretty wide variety of comment letters um, with, with, as you can suggest, you know, varying, varying views. Uh, for this group, probably what's important is that investors largely repeated views of the IEG, uh, that, that they want the information, that that information needs to be made public, um, and, and it's meant to provide them with meaningful information to help them in voting on auditor selection. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please. Next slide, please. So rolling forward a little bit since the board last engaged with the investor advisory group on this topic, uh, we've, we've not issued a rule or a standard referred to as audit quality indicators or, or firm metrics, but we have through other rulemakings um, required that firms provide certain information to us uh, that we make public and, and that would include the information as mentioned earlier that submitted on form AP, which includes the disclosure of the name of the engagement partner, other um, auditors that are involved in the audit. And I, I wanted to point this out because I, I think we heard a few times at the last meeting that how we provide data and the availability of data, the searchability of, the, of data is important and, and it's probably more important today than, than it might have been a few years ago. We've also required through um, amending the audit report um, that the auditor disclose critical audit matters and auditor tenure, um, which may not be directly on point, but are somewhat related to information that, that people said would be valuable. Um, and th this may touch on, for example, auditor tenure and, and the reason why we call the project firm and engagement performance metrics. What we found is indicators that actually tell you what all audit quality is or that indicate audit quality may be a little bit elusive. But nonetheless, there are other data points which stakeholders find important. Uh, or at least useful in, in their considerations. Now, the information that is disclosed in the auditor's report or through Form AP 
uh, is subject to review, verification, and comment by the PCOB. And the related inspection deficiencies today appear in part 1B of our inspection reports. Uh, next hey, slide, please. Hey, Bob, oh, sure. I, I see two hands up. So I see Praveen oh, okay. and, and Gina. So Praveen, you're, you're next. And then we'll turn it over to Gina for her question. Uh, thank you, Sama. I just wanted to follow up. Uh, am I? Am I? Am I? Am I? Is there I can echo? hear e echoes. Yes. If you're not speaking, please please remember to mute yourselves. Can Maybe. you hear me? Hear me. Yes. Because I'm listening on the phone, and I think that's why the echo is coming. Yeah. I think that's okay. Fine. I'll be quick. Just to follow up on Lynn's point, is there any accelerated process to put items like the AQI on a fast track agenda to accomplish something rather than keep repeating the history? Well, you, you've heard from our chair, which probably carries more weight than than me saying it. But I think there may be opportunities to address certain aspects of this through projects that are already on our agenda and, and then other things I think we'll see other aspects of this we'll see as we go. Some disclosures might not require any standard setting and that's information that may be made available through our inspection reports or, or otherwise. Okay, so I, I take that as a, that answers your question, Parvina. So Gina is next. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, so um, I, having spent quite a bit of time um, uh, going through the Form APs in preparation for my own presentation, which by the way, if anybody ever wants to like really get to know everything that the PCAOB does, volunteer for my committee. Um, <laughs> So, 1 of the things that I wanted to suggest um, that would be very helpful in terms of a data point that you could add to the form AP is some kind of standardized. Um, uh, standardized way of uh, representing the audit audit partners industry um, specialization in terms of their experience um, in the literature review. Um, I found at least um, 1 uh, study that showed that that could be. Um, and uh, a strong indicator for um, uh, uh, for kind of a reduction of the potential for fraud in terms of audit audit partner industry specialization. So I know that there's sort of a there can be a bio, but that's very unstructured. So you know if you can think about ways to 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 include in the form AP. Um, some kind of, of indicator that relates to the audit partners um, industry specific experience relative to the company's industry. Thank you. Saba, do you see any other questions before we? Yes, I see Jeff and Hal. So we'll have Jeff first and then Hal. Jeff, you're next, and, and and after hell, there's David too. Thank you. So just wanted to one, add one small point uh, to your presentation, Barbara. You mentioned the auditor ratification vote, um, but it was also intended to provide information with respect to the vote regarding the election or re-election of the audit committee chair and audit committee members. Uh, that's another area where there's not a lot of information uh, to assist investors in making that vote. And the idea was that this would help provide some additional information in that regard, as well as with respect to the, the investors general overs oversight uh, regarding the audit committee. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So, Hal, you're next. Barb, is there any, and I didn't want to jump in or, or front and run Gina on this, but as I was listening to Jean and, and I read her uh, presentation before today's session, the first thing I thought about was AQRs are helpful, but if I just looked at AQRs in a vacuum, I would, I would struggle with coming to some definitive conclusions. But if I were to link it 
with the XBRL file of each individual institution, I'm, I'm going to use banks because that's what I'm most familiar with, I would be looking at their adoption of CECL, grouping it by firm, then grouping it by partner within firm, and that got to Gina's point about specialization. Um, particularly for mid-cap and smaller names, I'd look for patterns of a specific partner doing multiple jobs, consistency between numbers. I would start to really have some strong um, information, or at least potential for, for good analysis, if I could link those two. I know personally that XBRL is not always the easiest to use, and I didn't know if somebody at the PCAOB had gone through the exercise of making sure that we could link AQR information, uh, a, a, AQI, AQR, AQR information with the specific XBRL filing for that particular entity. It's certainly something we and, could have and someone. It, it sounds at. trivial, but my experience tells me it will not be easy. And I've gotten Gene is like, yes. Um, <laughs> So if we can, you know, go through that exercise and figure out what we can do to make that easier for investors, I think it'll make this analysis of the potential for analysis far more robust. Hal, this okay. is Christina. Um, I think that's a really good suggestion. There are entity identifier, obviously, in the XBRL filing uh, in the Edgar database, um, and I think in the form AP um, and, and, and the audit, we, we can certainly look at whether I, that same entity identifier exists. exists. Yeah, I know, I know conceptually it should work, but I also know that things that are conceptual don't always actually work in practice. So I just, if, if you guys can test that and make sure that it actually works, and then even in presentations, maybe you can show the linkage between that information, that would be a really robust presentation for investors. Yeah, I think if, um, if that data is already collected, uh, then you, you know, the challenge might be data quality linking is possible, but if it's not already collected, then collecting the data, that will be another process. But I do think that I agree with you completely that linking multiple data sources is where you get more insights and, and brings the power to the consumer of the data. Thank, oh, thank you, this, you for that. This is really helpful. Thank you, Christina. You're welcome. So I see a couple of more hands up. So David, Lynn, and Sandy. David, you're next. Hey, yeah. Th th thank. Thanks, Saba. Yeah. And 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 I guess this this comment um comes from the sort of same perspective as my previous one, which is about uh, uh, seeing this from the perspective of the of the investor. And as we're thinking about firm level metrics, have we really thought about what investors want? And Sandy, I see you're talking later, but the CFA Institute study, for example, about the really important um, a, a a thing about the audit having the auditors having good communication with investors. Are we pulling that out? Are we managing to find any measures that might help make that judgment? It's similarly the critical nature of the independence of the auditor from the from the audited company. Is there any way that we could pull out those sorts of things, Barbara? Because I suspect those are those are things that, as Sandy's uh, research shows, are very important to investors for whom these audits are being done. And now that's certainly something to consider. Saba, did you say there was one one more? Comment? Yeah, no, there are a couple. So there is. Okay. Uh, so Len is next. Then there is Sandy, and then Nemeth, and then S Sandy, Sandy Peters, and Sandy Rich. So Len, you're next. The point that Hal makes is a very good one. When we did, when we started up Glass Lewis and did financial research there. We actually built models that did exactly what uh, Hal was talking about, 
we use capital IQ or fact set to pull the data into the models plus track then on our own some of the audit uh, factors and it when you merge the statistical information you could get on companies with the information you could get on auditors it became um, exceedingly powerful one at the large asset managers the capital group who runs the american funds has spent a considerable amount of time uh, attempting to do this and research it and they brought in uh, high talented research people to uh, work on it so i'd encourage you barb to reach out and have discussions with the people at the capital group to better understand what they've looked at because they definitely have uh, keyed into some uh, factors. The, the other part of it though is to do what Hal is suggesting and it's excellent. You have to have a system where you can get that information via data feeds. And the problem with um, the AP form is someone has to come in and do it a form at a time. And that doesn't work for any of these large asset managers. It's just not feasible to do. It becomes too costly, too expensive, too time consuming. And so the PCLB is going to have to change its technology to where it can provide that type of information via direct data feeds to the large asset managers uh, or it just won't work. You know, that's helpful. I, I do know that it's it's probably not easy or sophisticated as you suggest, um, but but we do sometimes guide people with questions on, on how to get better access to, to the entire data set. And I know some people have inquired about, um, you know, different ways of looking at the data, but that, that's very helpful. Thank you. I have a question um, that really as a, what uh, Lynn and Hal talked about um, make me, you know, I just came up with this thought, um, you know, especially um, with regard to how long this has been on the agenda, and uh, and you know, when when we talk about performance metrics, um, that's generally not a short effort. Uh, to expedite equipping investor with more information, um, do you think it would be helpful or easier for investor to be armed with data that is consumable? And, and to to Lynn's point, uh, you know, make it machine readable, uh, consumable for the data available, uh, would that be helpful versus, um, you know, because coming up with performance metric and, and you know, I had the experience of doing that in the government and if I, at Treasury, uh, we have the 1990 CFO Act where uh, Congress asked federal agency to start doing financial reporting, but the ultimate goal was for performance management, which 40 years later, there's still no standardized performance measure, um, as some of you might know already. So it's a it's not a short endeavor because of the challenge, various challenges. Some could be excuses, but um, you know, to show progress in, in a short period of time, uh, relatively speaking, and to you know help an arm investor with more data, would that be uh, uh, you know, comparing to the two, would that be a more helpful endeavor so that when you have the data, investors can use use it and link it to different things. Of course, we have to do data standardization, otherwise you can't link anything. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, brainstorming here. I'm not even saying this is you know, what what the board is trying to do or anything like that. It just came to my mind. Thank you, Christina. This is great. I think Lynn has some follow-up and then we'll move on to Sandy Peters. 
Glenn, please. Yeah, first of all, uh, Christina, I'd like to reach out and give you a hug because <laughs> it is great to hear this interaction from a board member rather than just all of us talking to have those questions from the board and have that dialogue is fantastic. So I give you kudos for that. Thank you very much. With respect to arming the investors with that additional data uh, and the data feeds that it can allow them then to go uh, look at that and consider it, especially uh, in light of what Hal said, I think that would be extremely par powerful in the market. And I think it would help uh, from the perspective of if you give them that data, then the markets can undertake to do some of the uh, disciplining, if you will, and and drive the quality uh, to a higher level rather than always having to wait for a regulator. And of course, you don't have the resources to do all that with the capital markets around the world anyway. So I think you actually make the functioning of the markets much more efficient, much more effective by giving those data feeds to the investors and let them then work on it in the context of uh, making decisions of where to allocate capital and what the risks are. So I think your point is spot on target. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you to both. So Sandy Peters is next, then we have Nemeth, Sandy, Rich, and then Hal and Gina. Stop, if I could just just add one thing to Christina's comment before we sure. move on. Okay, sure. directly, directly on point. Um, I would just be cautious. I would take a walk before we run approach instead of pushing more data. You know, let's focus on quality, consistency, and linkage of the various data sets before you add more data. So, and the, and the reason is I agree with Lynn that if we show them that it works, more and more people will then discipline the system. But if we don't do those steps early on and it, and it fails or the quality is not there and consistency is not there and linkages aren't there, then they won't come back for years and you won't get all those added benefits that Lynn was suggesting we'll get. And I believe that they will come, but we have to have some early successes in that process to, um, for them to spend time and effort to take advantage of them. Thank you, Hal. That's really helpful. Sandy Peters, you're next. Uh, yeah, I raised my hand to agree with um, Hal. In the survey that I put in the link, um, which isn't available, I guess, to any um, those that are listening, but it's on our website. It's audit value quality priorities. If you just Google CFA Institute, we did it after this concept released in 2015. It was in 2018. But in there, we talk about the need for context, which I think is to Hal's point of um, um, we need to be able to understand this data in the context of, of the actual organization. As a heavy user of Form AP, in fact, I'm going through right now and updating a 2018 paper that we did that looked at um, all of the S&P 500 audit partners, I think that the usability of the database is very hard, um, particularly like you know, if there's a multitude of offerings and the like is to something simple that gives you an indicator of this is the 10, uh, this is the annual filing and this, you know, it's very hard to pick it out, which one is actually the one that you should um, use. Um, you should be using. So I just wanted to um, add those comments and I'm enraging agreement with Hal about context. Thank you, Sandy. So Nemeth is next. Thank you, Sava. Uh, I want to build on a point that uh, David touched upon and then uh, board member Christina as well uh, mentioned. This is uh, from a user standpoint, one of the challenges of assessing audit quality is isolating the, the quality of work done by the auditors from the quality of financial statements prepared by the issuer. Uh, so in this regard, a specific suggestion that uh, I as a researcher have used and I found very helpful is data on audit adjustments. Uh, such data tell us what the unaudited numbers were and then how the audit changed those financial statement numbers. Uh, I realize the ownership of some of this data exists with, with the firms and 
and there's a question of whether it can be disclosed. But uh, I just want to point out that that information I think would would uh, uh, would help users uh, tease out what auditors do and the quality of work uh, uh, that they do. Namit, um, I recall from my audit day if if the adjustments that auditor identify and the issuer didn't and and they and it's material enough they have to incorporate it they will have a uh if it's material they will have a, a corresponding material weakness because of the icfr uh requirement that that the the management has a uh, internal control to to make sure that they can detect any material misstatement. So if it actually gets detected by the auditors, uh, and they the, the the financial statement might be, you know, adjusted, but they would end up with a potentially a material weakness in their internal control, which would be included in the audit report, I believe. So I, I believe this might be a question of magnitude, but uh, like the I think the more granular data, which I believe the PCOB collects when they conduct inspections of specific uh, specific engagements, it is more granular, and and the uh, audit adjustments then is at at specific line item levels. Uh, so so the and what I've seen even from that uh, that I've, the data I've access is from other countries, and again it's. It's a little bit more granular, so it does not result in any uh, observable output. So, so some of this just comes as a result of negotiations, say between uh, between issuers and, and and auditors regarding what the appropriate accrual adjustment should be, uh, or what the appro uh, appropriate accrual amount should be. But uh, that I think helps us get a sense for uh, uh, what what the auditor is doing. Okay, yeah, it's been a long time ago, so I I apologize for you know I, I was just trying to think uh, brainstorm ways you could already find that information, so I apologize. So, so any any other questions or comments right now? Yeah, yeah. Sandy has uh, Sandy Rich and then Jonathan, two more. So we'll take these two and then move on to the presentation because. I want to make sure that Barb has has a chance to finish her presentation. Sandy, you're you're next. Thank you, Saba. Um, just Hal and Lynn are absolutely on point. This information, if it is not Edgarized, is largely useless. And well, at least to large institutional investors like I represent, um, we are actually as an institutional investor pushing for. Edgarization of many proxy statement disclosures because language analytics are not sufficiently sophisticated to extract the information we are looking for. Um, and, and I, you know, thank you, Sandy, for posting the CFA report. I was actually looking at page 11 and I would raise the question as to whether you're got too many critical data points, to be honest, I, I, so I, always... I, I should say this wasn't meant to be all of them. It was meant to identify, it was meant to identify what was most important. So it wasn't even all of them. Wow. Cause. Oh, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm oh, saying okay. is we gave them a series of options to ascertain a population, which may be greater than what they actually intend. So that we could discern a span of what was most important. That's well, I, I often struggle as an analyst with the Deming observation that, you know, without data, you you just have an opinion. And my interpretation of that in these circumstances is with too much data, you have everything but an opinion. If you're too confused to process what is effectively an avalanche of conflicting information, or even if it's not conflicting, it's very difficult to homogenize into a view that leads you to a decision. And I, you know, it's just, when I see lists as long as that, I see 
more confusion likely to come out of it than conclusion. And perhaps that's a. But we were saying all of these would end up being items. We were trying yeah. to ascertain what investors believe our decision useful so that we could cull it down to the things that were most important, obviously understanding that it's not an infinite data set that we can actually um, um, get. And when you, when you say Edverize, do you mean XBRL to tag yes. them? Okay. Yes, it, get, it, get it into a machine readable form that can be compared across companies and across industries. And that's, it's gotta be numerical. It can't be, it can't be language related analysis because that it does not produce. It, it's very difficult to use language analysis to come to conclusions other than to raise questions in my opinion. So it can't be language. It has to be a number it has to be a, a yes or a no, or a relative, you know, a relative 1 to 10 type thing. Because really, you know, it's very difficult to. I mean, if you're managing hundreds of billions of dollars, we don't, we, if, if we can't get it off a computer and it isn't summarized on a page, it is largely useless to us. Thank you. This is, this is Thank great. So, so we'll just take these two next two questions and then move on to Bar Barb's presentation. So Jonathan, I see your hand up and Alicia, and then after that, we'll just move on to the Barb's presentation. So. Any more questions will be addressed after that. Can you Jonathan? all hear me fine? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Jonathan Fluharty. I'm a financial economist at OERA, and I, I work in part on, on the uh, firm and engagement metrics uh, team. And one aspect that uh, Lynn has raised, um, I was wondering if we would move into sort of a, at least awareness of that topic and providing uh, the information and data um, that we are getting is, is the potential for uh, auditors to to seekingly manipulate the numbers uh, for their benefit um, and how we, we want to think about that. That was something that came out of uh, the court case that Lynn has has referenced uh, here today. So uh, I think that's also something to keep in mind with respect to uh, this particular topic. So I'll, I'll just leave that comment there. Thank you, Jonathan. Alicia, I see your hand. Thank you, Saba. Um, I'm just struck by the breadth of our conversation that has been triggered uh, by firm level metrics and, and just data, broadly speaking, and recognizing that inevitably, it, just speaking to sort of my work as an analyst and portfolio manager, finding that balance between granularity of data with relevant data, right? So having the right data points in order to convert them to information and then into insights so that I can make a decision as an investor versus just having a, a treasure trove of data, which doesn't necessarily either is inaccessible because of the nature of the way the data is presented, but also doesn't necessarily uh, enable you to reach a decision. I think I think we need to be, be thinking about these things from uh, from sort of this broader perspective, because just more data is often not the answer in my experience, and it just complicates the situation and, and obfuscates uh, the value of what might already be there in place. Can I say, I, I, I feel the need to say something here, because the reality of it is, is that investors have little to no data on the audience. They have an audit opinion with a critical audit matter, right? So, to some degree, you're arguing against yourself because of the fact that you have what's in the form AP and you have the audit opinion, and that's all you have. So, certainly, we at CFA Institute have argued for the relevant data that's important to decision making, but right now there's nothing. So, they're not, it's a credence good, right? So what we're trying to do is endeavor to isolate what investors think is most important to that decision-making process. And so I worry when we say as an investor group, we're worried about too much data, that that will be as someone who has lived, has lived this experience, 
um, where it's like, oh, investors are overwhelmed with information. No, they're not. They have computers and they can get, we totally agree on quantitative data. We have said that. We believe all the textual data should be tagged as well because you can use NLP to do it. Is it as good? No, but it gives you something, right? Um, but my concern is that as an investor advisory group, we also need to discern what is most important because the narrative that, oh, we'll be so confused will be quickly adopted to lead you to nothing. That's my concern. I'll only simply raise it as someone who fought the disclosure overload narrative for financial reporting in 2013. Um, and now all we have, we kept saying, but people want ESG data, investors want ESG data. Oh yeah, but they're overloaded, right? So I agree that we have to get the right data, but we have to make sure that the message is delivered in a way that the relevant versus the totality is not lost and, it, and it, there's a mistaken narrative of like, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I've been down this road, so. I could not agree more with uh, with what Sandy said. I mean, she said it very well. Well, thank you all for this lively discussion. I think we should just, I just want to be mindful of time. And I know we have like 21 minutes to be exact left. So, Barb, I'll hand it over back to you. For your yes, certainly. Sa Saab is overly generous calling this a presentation. I mean, honestly, it was really just meant to, to get the discussion going. And I, so I think that's achieved the objective and, and very happy to hear all of the views. Um, something else, I guess, that is meant to just inform you about the current state of the world. So I think since we had these conversations early on, firms have um, started to publish various, I'll call it firm level information through their public reports. And I think Lynn touched on this. Um, and so just for your information to, to give you a feel for those of you who maybe not don't spend that much time in the transparency reports, we just put together an appendix uh, for the group's consideration of what we saw in looking at several firms, most recent quality reports. So, um, you know, not, nothing much too much exciting there, but again, just for the group's considerations. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please. Similarly, um, you know, as I noted in 2017, <clears throat> the IG pointed out that other audit regulators had made progress. And what we did, again, just to inform the group and the group's thinking after the meeting uh, is to note more, more current activity ar around the globe. Um, some of the approaches are interesting. Some of the regulators have taken a phased approach, um, with starting with information being disclosed to them, I think with the ultimate goal of making the information available publicly. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please. Uh, and you, you could advance it again. So uh, probably unnecessary at this point. Um, I, I don't know that this was meant to be a complete list of questions, but really rather a conversation starter. And, and I think that we've already had some, some good conversation. So again, I'll, I'll just pause here to hear other views. If anyone wants to weigh in on, on the questions, uh, we're very lucky to, to have on the staff um, currently um, someone who worked on the concept release and, and he actually gave me a, another list of questions if, if we run uh, long on time and short on commentary, but, but I don't think that'll be the case today. So I see a couple of hands up. Alicia, uh, is your hand up from the previous session or do you have a question? Okay. Apologies, so, I forgot to pull it down. That's okay, it happens to me all the time. Gina Sanchez and then Neva. Uh, thanks, I just wanted to um, thank you for, the, it definitely was a conversation starter without a doubt. And we will have even more time to discuss it um, when we get to the data and technology presentation um, that I prepared. But I think one of the things I do want to um, 
I, I want to underscore here that just to make sure as we do takeaways um, is that um, Hal's point about linkages is very important and we have quite a bit of literature that I'll review in my own presentation as to how this data has been used and this is people who are breaking their heads to get the data put together into data sets. I mean, Sandy Peters couldn't be more correct in that the data is very, very difficult to use um, and and you know that 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 we are by no means overloaded yet uh, and it will be a very long time before that that occurs. Um, but I, I just want to underscore the that we have a lot of examples already um, through academic research um, that that there is a desire and already validation that the data can in fact be very useful for, for fraud detection and prevention and that to Christina's point um, that she asked about sort of you know is making this data useful to investors you know investors are not all created equally but what helps is when you get investors um, like the capital group who are making an effort to publish research um, it does increase the transparency overall um, and that is the overarching goal here is to have more eyes um, on on these efforts. And so I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you, Gina, for the comment. And yes, there will be more on this topic when Gina presents later this afternoon. So, Nemeth, you're next. Uh, I just want to touch upon what uh, Barbara said that uh, some of the information on, on audit quality indicators or or what audit firms are doing is already disclosed at the at the firm level. Uh, I want to emphasize that you know the the granularity of the data is is really important to understand to to how useful that information is. So uh, when information is dis is disclosed at the engagement level, I think there's there can be a lot. It can be a lot more useful than when it's disclosed at uh, at the firm level. In fact. Uh, even at the audit office level, offices have uh, reputations for, for being high quality or low quality. So, uh, so I think uh, to the extent there's more, it's the information is more granular. It it makes a huge difference. Uh, so I, I see Nemeth. I mean, Nemeth, are you still speaking? Because I I can't hear you. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. I, okay. I just want to make that point. Saying yeah. That, uh, information is disclosed to the firm level. Uh, it's uh, the extent to which it's useful is is just a lot different when it's disclosed at the audit office level or at the at the individual engagement level. Okay, thank you. So I see Jack and then board member this party. So Jack, you're next, and then board member this party. Thank you, Saba. Uh, just wanted to say in reference to the, the prior uh, list of questions about input from the IAG about what they'd like to see, uh, I think you have to think big. And we, we don't have, it's not 1992 anymore, it's 2022. Databases and distribution of data is you know, very economically produced and you can get a lot of information out there to everybody. I don't think it has to be just that you have data that's downloaded by APIs to like a capital group or a T. Rowe Price. I think when you design the performance indicators and get them on board, you know, take the auditor search model that you have and you know bring it into 2022 and put the whole thing out there and make it searchable and comprehensive so that any investor can use it and extract from it what they want. Uh, as Sandy said, make it XBRable, XBRL level, Edgarable. But uh, you know, I, I think that we're way behind on, on getting this kind of information out to investors. You know, all we're looking for really is circumstantial evidence that a quality audit has been performed and even then all we can do is just approve or disapprove of whether we want the auditors to return. Um, and we're not even getting enough information to make that kind of a circumstantial judgment. Um, so I, I really think that this is an urgent kind of project for the PCAOB and it's taken far too long. And I think we're setting our, our sights too low by saying we're gonna have too much information if we do this. I, 
I think we really have to try to start experimenting and set a timeline for getting it done. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Jack. That's helpful. Thank you, Jack. That's helpful. I can hear my echoes. This board member just parting. I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank, thank you, Saba. And I want to thank everybody. It's a really good discussion, very thoughtful. Um, I don't know if um, folks can go on mute if, if you're not on mute here with an echo, but um, I, I will underscore Nevitt's uh, point about, you know, we talk about firm level and then engagement level. And I, I, I will also offer that we hear from audit committee members quite often that they would really appreciate the engagement level metrics, you know, on their specific uh, on their specific issuer. And I've heard, you know, the discussion here about relevance, about reliability, consistency, about context. And um, that's one thing as this project moves forward, I'm interested in how you all think about what good looks like, because I, I know the firm sometimes, you know, there's a focus on the firms from an input measure about, well, let's not compress all the work at your end, let's try to spread the work more evenly, and they believe that'll drive better quality. But at the same time, if you have a metric about how much work was performed after year end versus before, if there was a big issue, a big transaction towards the end of the year, well, then you'd expect more work perhaps to be done near year end. And so that context that I heard some talk about and, and the qualitative aspects that go around the measures, I am curious how how you how the investors are thinking about that as they analyze. And, and the other thing is. With the big firms, you kind of can get into the law of averages where, you know, for many, many clients that these big firms have, how will the investor really get a good sense without it being more engagement uh, specific and be therefore need to be more in context. So really good discussion. I just offer those few thoughts, you know, that I'm interested in learning more about as, as we move forward. Thank you. Just board member display that is really really helpful i see sandy's sandy peter's hand hand up and then david Petterson. yeah i just wanted to say something about the fact it sort of aligns with what jack said and then what you said Dwayne. i mean the reality is is that we can't let perfection be the enemy of something right that and that we have said that give it to the audit committee and have them go through it first and then share it with investors, right? So that they can add context because there are agents, right? Just like management is an investor's agent, the audit committee is our agent. We need them to have the information that they need to evaluate it, just as you said, right? The audit committee just talks to the auditor. They don't look at the work papers, right? This is a big game of telephone at some point, right? You guys look at the work papers, but you're not in the conversation with the audit committee and investors are like, okay, everybody's sort of talking to each other. How do we evaluate this, right? We're looking for something to start a conversation, right? And we always believe that relevance is more important than reliability. And that violates the some auditors and I was one. So um, that makes them feel bad, but um, it's like, we can't let perfection be the enemy of something. So to Jack's comment about a moonshot or whatever, right? We need to start somewhere. And I think the audit committee can be a good first step. Thank you, Sandy. I see David's hand up. David, and then Pat, you're next. Thanks. I, 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 I thought a board member department's question was absolutely um, an excellent one, because I, I guess at the center of having this new information is that we get better audits out of it. And that often when we think about information, we think about it being exogenous, like taking the temperature of the patient and then the doctor can tell you whether you need to go to bed or not and what, what, what's wrong with you. I, I think that if you're thinking about this, you might also want to think about the endogeneity of the information, the way that it affects the person who's being measured, the auditor, a bit like the way that the person who sets the exam script makes a difference to what it is that the student actually studies. And as somebody who I'm an investor, but I have a sat on the board in the UK 
of one of the big four accountants and the audit quality reviews done by the FRC really focused their mind. I, they did sort of make a little bit of an impact on investors and the investors would raise it with the uh, with the auditors. But but that endogenous information was absolutely critical. It, it, it changed what it was that people were doing. And um, that, of course, brings you back to all the other questions that we've been asking about. Well, what information do you actually want here? Because you will get what you measure if you start measuring these things. So we need to be sure that we're measuring the right thing. But I think about the way that it'll directly affect the auditor as well as the way that it'll affect an investor who will then think about the way they vote or, or, or whatever they do. Similarly, for the for the audit committee chair, et cetera, et cetera. So I see hell and then then. A quick question for Barb and I, and I apologize for not knowing this. Whose name, what partner's name is being listed or would be listed? Is it the only the lead, the, the top, top partner? Or is it the second tier, the third tier for for large multi engagements? You could have 10, 15, 20 partners. Uh, the lead partner, but that that's a I, good point. I, I would really challenge that, particularly if you have more junior partners um, that are also leading other engagements. I'd want to have a get a general sense as to what their special uh, you know their industry their industry specialization is are they playing a role on a bigger engagement and carrying that information to the smaller engagement i would really want to know kind of structurally how they were set up particularly if i were taking an industry focus so just give that one thought thank you so we're at the five minute mark five minutes till we take a break len you're next and then sandy rich your question, Saba or Barb, was where would you put this information in terms of disclosure? Uh, probably the most logical place for me is in the proxy because it's right next to the uh, audit committee that you're voting on as well as with the auditor. But you guys don't control or have any uh, authority over the disclosures in the proxy. So I doubt that would work unless you could work that out with the SEC, which I suspect perhaps you could. The other option is make it part of the audit report. My only concern there is I think some of these factors will not be pulled together by the time you do the audit report each year and issue it. Uh, so it just may take some coordination with the SEC. If you put it into the, can get them to agree to put it into the proxy, then it can all be eggerized to uh, house point and make access to it a lot easier. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. So, uh, Sandy, you're next. Thank you, Saba. So, just, just listening to this conversation, it makes me think of the governance structure of all these things because we're these, these quality indicators are basically trying to penetrate through the, you know, oversight that the audit committee has, the board committee has, the auditor, PCA will be watching the auditor, the SEC watching the financials. And at some point, I think there's a question of what is the governance structure of corporations in related to SEC, the auditor, the audit committee, the directors, the PCAOB, and the and any other regulator, including state level CPA organizations, which monitor CPE credits, they monitor accreditation, they monitor the responsibilities of auditors. So it's at some point this conversation has to include that governance structure and con and the concept that if we choose to have quality indicators that seek to bypass that governance structure, that's definitely something we could do, right? And there are analysts who wish to 
pursue that. But if we are trying to strengthen the governance structure, I think we have to identify where these quality indicators should be positioned, right? That is it the audit committee? Is it the PCA OB watching the auditors? Is it the state CPA organizations which monitor the auditors? I mean I think that's a big that's a big question, the, the governance here, because if, if it's definitely possible to provide audit quality indicators on every piece of information that's reviewed. Every time the auditor has a question on the representations of the CFO, that could definitely be accounted for. It could be published. We have the computer capacity to include all that stuff. Question is, should we? I, I, it seems to me, I'm not, it's not clear to me that we should do that on all these things. But no, just a question. No, it's a it's a really interesting question. I mean, definitely for for someone who is not from from this background, like this is just really thought provoking. So thank you for sharing this. Uh, I see one more hand, and after this, we'll take a quick break, fifteen minutes break. So Alicia, you're next, and then after this question, we'll take a break and be promptly back at three fifteen for our next presentation. Alicia. Thank you. Just one more, just a minute to echo what Sandy has just said. And, you know, if I come back to the original comment that I made, I think we want to be thinking about not just quality, but quantity, but within the context of how this all fits. Right? I don't know that the PCAOB is actually positioned to be able to be do all and be all things to everybody out there. There is, this is a very complex mix of professionals, licensed professionals in many cases, as well as individuals with, you know, with competencies and leveraging how this is supposed to work, I think bears some consideration, if not significant consideration. We all want more data. I absolutely concur. I oftentimes am a data nerd, but, but I've also learned that I think we want the right data and that's actually a really difficult question to answer sometimes thank you thank you alicia this is actually a great discussion i am delighted and i'm sure everyone else is is learning a lot and enjoying this conversation so we'll we'll be back at 3 15 we'll take a 15 minutes break and back for our next presentation from gina sanchez thank you everyone